labels of advice I can give anybody is that, you know, you should train and you should train with as many people as you can. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 470, with today's guest, Sifu Nathan Marinoni. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, show host and Whistlekick founder, and everything we're doing over here at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find everything that we're doing. It's the place to find our store, and if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15% on everything. Now, everything for this show is on a different website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you this show twice a week, and our goal here, it's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show and the work that we do, there are a number of ways you can help. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media. You know, we're at Whistlekick everywhere you can think of. You could tell a friend about us. Maybe pick up one of the books that we've written and have listed on Amazon, leave a review somewhere, or support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick is the place to go for that. You can support us monthly with as little as $2, and if you spend $5 a month, you'll get access to even more content, content that we make exclusively for the Patreon supporters. Different martial artists train differently. Some of us, maybe even most of us, start at a local school and we study a single style, and we progress. Some people move, so they train in different things, they go to different schools. But today's guest does it his own way. And he's done it his own way since the very beginning. And that's led to some pretty impressive experiences. And we get to hear all about those today on the show. Sifu Marinoni, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks, Jeremy, for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. You know, we were, we were just talking audience. We were just talking, you know, that I have a great job and I do have a great job and I fully, <laughs> sure. I fully understand. I fully recognize that. I mean, there, you sure. know, it's not, it's not all fun. You know, I don't think anyone would, would pretend it is or expect that it is, but you know, I, I get to talk to great people. I get to talk to you, you know, and, well, thank you. Uh, and it's, it's just, I don't know. I don't even know that I have the, the ability to express how lucky I am, mm. but it's not about me. And that's, and that's kind of the weird part. You know, I, I, I'm just blessed I get to talk to everyone. So today we're talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm here to find out what makes you tick and your stories and, sure. and where you've come from and where you are and where you're going and all that. And so we're going to do the very cliche, very boring way to kick it off because it's the best way to kick it off. That's how'd you find martial arts? Sure. Well, I just want to say thank you again for, for having me on your uh, podcast. I'm a fan. And I look forward to, you know, sharing my story. So I, I guess uh, everything really started back in the 80s when I was young, about, I don't want to say uh, 10, 11. Uh, we actually lived right across the street from a Taekwondo instructor who actually coincidentally was a level five CO officer, corrections officer. So we came into contact with him one day and again, found out that he taught Taekwondo really just out of his basement, didn't have any school. Um, and my sister started shortly after. Um, of course, at that time, I didn't see any value in it, <laughs> but then I, I, I somewhat took note of her coming home, doing her forms outside. Uh, I said, you know, this looks pretty cool. Uh, so really much through the late eighties, I'd be traveling with uh, my sister and, uh, who was soon to be my uh, Taekwondo instructor. Uh, his name was Sabanem Marin Le- uh, Levy. So I would, I would go through these, these tournaments from the late eighties and it was, it was, it was really cool for me. Um, because really just growing up as a kid, everything was Transformers and Ninja Turtles. Uh, so now I kind of opened in, opened up that whole world to ninjas and, and you know, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee and, and that whole, you know, side of everything. And then really just shortly after, I started to do Taekwondo with him across the street. Um, was interesting. He didn't have a lot of children. He had a lot of adults. And, you know, I, I guess the first thing I should have known better is when I walked downstairs in the basement, there was several holes in the wall <laughs> and it, it, it wasn't because he was doing any kind of carpentry uh, it's because the adults tend to spar a, a bit hard i guess at that time with, with very very little little padding um he was trained by an old taekwondo master his uh, name is escaped me i think it was chung was the last name um but i stuck around to i want to say about yellow belt so i wasn't there for too too long i, I realized it really just wasn't 
what I was looking for uh, as far as what kind of clicked with me and stuff. I remember getting up to Chunji level, which was, uh, I guess, the first form you would learn and stuff. And one of the first memories I have was actually sparring with my sister, which was interesting. Uh, my sister was a few years younger than me. So at the time, okay, if I can ballpark it, I was about maybe 12. And she was, I want to say nine. Hey, one of my first memories was she was a red belt at the time, which was, uh, that's one belt short of black. And I remember chasing her around and her doing a jump spinning back kick into my stomach. <laughs> and I remember going home and complaining to my parents that, you know, my sister hit me and, and really hit me hard. You know what I mean? And I kind of got to look to my father and I said, well, you know, you're, you're, you're doing martial arts now and, you know, she's better than you, you know? So after a little bit, like I said, it really wasn't my taste of tea. Um, kind of searched around a little bit afterwards, got into the early 90s. And uh, that's when I really started to take things really kind of serious, about 92, uh, 93, when I was, was, and I was in middle school and stuff. Kind of got picked on a lot, um, like a lot of people do who, you know, want to start learning martial arts, had a terrible stubborn problem. Um, you know, and just really wanted to do something about it. I used to, you know, it sounds a little cliche, but, you know, I used to get beat up and picked on. And, you know, I'm a pretty short guy. I'm about 5'7". You know, I don't weigh a whole lot. I think right now I currently weigh about, you know, 159. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I wanted to learn how to defend myself. And I found with the Taekwondo, it didn't really satisfy my interest um, in doing that style of martial arts. I enjoyed the kicking and enjoyed the forms. But I wanted something more. It just it didn't fit me. So I remember a few years later, the UFC had Hoist Gracie on, right? We had that big, big explosion of, of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, and, and ground grappling. And of course, in early mid-90s, you just you couldn't find that around anywhere, right? The closest school you could probably find to that was a judo school, right? So um, what I started to do is Black Belt Magazine used to have this old tape video production series called Panther Productions, right, out of California, I believe. And they used to have different people teaching, uh, uh, you know, Aikido, karate. But they also had people teaching Sambo and, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Shu and things like that. So what I did is I put every penny together and I purchased a whole bunch of uh, VHS tapes. And really for the next few years, I really kind of invested myself into that. Uh, really, this is, we're talking really mid nineties and I'm still in high school, you know, um, again, only real formal training was in Taekwondo late eighties and early nineties. Um, but I really enjoyed the grappling, really enjoyed, you know, the pinning, the locking, um, being a smaller guy, it always made sense to me, you know, just leverage in, in general and taking someone to the ground. You know, I was always, always kind of rough and tumble too, uh, for the most part. So I, so I did that for a few years and I would grab a few friends and we would actually just go right off the videotapes and we would practice, you know, guard and mount and arm bar. And, um, I got somewhat proficient at it. I guess someone, you know, you would consider to be as proficient as someone can be from, from learning from VHS tapes. And, um, later on when I was in high school, I actually joined the wrestling team, um, to really supplement what I was learning on, on, on film. Right. And it became, it became a nice vehicle to practice arm locks and leg locks and, and chokes and sweeps and everything else. The only problem is I had a hard time separating what was wrestling from what was jujitsu. <laughs> so in the beginning, you know, I used to pull guard and do everything you're not supposed to do in wrestling. And I remember a lot of times, you know, my coach would, you know, he, he would he would yell at me. He said, you know, you need to stop watching that stuff. You need to stop watching that stuff. And even my teammates used to get kind of, lack for a better term, annoyed that I would start choking them and, and arm locking them. But you know, again, I didn't have someone to teach me and walk me through and hold my hand to learn this because, again, it, we're talking mid '90s. That just wasn't around. Like I said, Hoist just came on the scene, and there really, really was no judo schools around me. Um, just a lot of karate and, and taekwondo schools, and obviously. My Taekwondo instructor across the street was, was, was there, right? So it was still very, very much still a new concept, as many of our listeners know. So I did that for a few years, wrestling, and I kind of used that as a base to help me to obviously not only familiarize myself with, with, with wrestling and take down pins and rides, but also use it as a vehicle to help out my jiu-jitsu. And I did that, I want to say, all through high school, up to about senior year, until I started 
to discover Jeet Kune Do. And that kind of really changed things for me. So really, up into mid to late 90s, I was really kind of self-trained, doing this grappling thing, watching videotapes, trying to soak in as much as I can and, and you know, just use my friends, you know, lack for a better word, as a, a heavy bag to practice my locks and choke and supplement my wrestling with that, right? So then in the early 90s, um, you know, just reading through Black Belt Magazine, I began to learn more about Jeet Kune Do and what Jeet Kune Do was and um, the different figureheads within Jeet Kune Do, Paul Runak and Dan Asanto and Tim Tech and all those those individuals that we have today. So once again, you know, um, I, I live in Connecticut, but I live in New England and, and, and I have always lived in Connecticut. I lived in Massachusetts for about seven years, then ended up moving back to Connecticut. So at that time, Stu, there was not really anybody around, again, teaching Jeet Kune Do, right? Um, still in high school. So, you know, had my driver's license, but the closest person was about an hour and a half, two hours away, right? So once again, I had to kind of find a way to, to learn this, right? Uh, I was, I've always been really proactive in, in just training martial arts and, and going and seeking knowledge and stuff. Um, so what I did is the best thing I could do is I found a home correspondence course. So there wasn't much out there like there is now. So there was a man named uh, David Elwood out of New Jersey, and he ran a organization called Total Approach Jeet Kune Do. Um, and, and please, Jeremy, if, if, if I keep talking, feel free to just to jump in. <laughs> I'll, I'll reel you back if you get out there too far, but I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm enjoying what I'm hearing. Keep going. Good. I'm still in work mode, so I guess I'm you know, still going. So, um, so uh, he really had the only uh, uh, martial arts correspondence course, right? And he was advertising it through Black Belt Magazine, um, and he was certified under a few JKD instructors, um, but the, the uh, name he continued to kind of uh, promote was a man named Leo Fong, who was a uh, old Bruce Lee student from, from back then. So fast forward, we're uh, a senior in high school. I did that for about three years. Um, he had each tapes for a level, typical, just, you know, just, just like you would think it, you would go through the curriculum, you would videotape yourself, and then you would submit it and be reviewed, right? So I did that for three years and I did it really, um, you know, I did it, what's what I'm looking for? Um, I was earnest in it. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't, uh, wasn't lazy on my training. I really trained it every day. You know, I was at the time I was 19, um, and I was really, really into it. So, you know, I, I really wanted to make sure that I got this and this is, you know, this is it, you know, and, at that time, I said, well, this is better than just learning by videotapes and not getting any type of feedback. And so I really wanted to make sure, because at that time, I really thought that this is as far as I'm going to get with this. You know, there, there's no one to teach Jeet Kune Do around me. So I'm going to dig into this and I'm going to make sure I, I train it and, I, and I, I train it right. Right. So I did that for a few years, um, completed the program in 2002, I, I, I believe. So I was good. I was set. I felt good about my skills. Um, I had some, some, some good knowledge. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny too, you know, Jeremy, a lot of people park on, you know, uh, YouTube or correspondence training. And I think it's good. I think if you don't have anything around, I think it's a good method to learn. And I think it sets you up for success. You know, I think it, it gives you good habits. I think it gives you a strong work ethic too. You know what I mean? Um, so in, in 2002, went and I completed that, that, that training. And then I discovered there was somebody in uh, Milford, Connecticut. Who is who's more uh, south of Connecticut from where I'm at? I was very much close to Massachusetts, um, teaching Jeet Kune Do. And you know, I've been driving for a few years. And I said, you know what? Why not? Let me contact this guy. His name was uh, Sifu Rick Menente. Unfortunately, he, he he passed a few years later. Um, so I contacted this, uh, Sifu Rick, and I said, hey, you know, my name is blah 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 blah. I just you know got done training with you know blah 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 blah. I'd be really interested in training with you, you know? And at that time, he just stopped doing, he used to have group classes downstairs. He lived on top of a deli, two floor. Um, the bottom floor was a deli and there was a big space in back where he used to teach. And then upstairs, there was almost like apartments, right? So he goes, you know what? Why don't you come down and meet me, you know, in two weeks? And that's what I did. So I, I drove down, it was about a two hour drive, not too bad. And it's really driving down to see him really kind of seasoned me and it really helped to um, get me in this habit of driving to, to really get the knowledge that I want, 
You know what I mean? Uh, which we'll I'll obviously get into a little bit later on. Um, so anyway, I, I, I went to see him and it was just fantastic. It was, you know, I had someone to work with and, and not just that, it was somebody who knew the material. So now I got that feel and that understanding and stuff. So I was lucky enough to work with him a few more times. You know, um, my training with him was, was, I would say it was brief. It was short, um, but it was very profound on me, you know, very, very, very profound. The things that he said and, and, and just the overall touch uh, that he had and his attitude towards things was just fantastic. And, you know, uh, Sifu Rick really was one of the pioneers for kind of spreading Jeet Kune Do around in, in the New England, slash, you know, Connecticut area. Um, for those who don't know, Sifu Rick was one of Paul Vunak's top guys from back in the 80s. Um, this is around when Sifu Paul Vunak used to go visit the uh, Navy SEALs and, and provide that training. Um, so it was just fantastic. And then in 2003, uh, he unfortunately passed away, right, which was just a big hit to people, right? Um, so what happened was I contacted shortly after, uh, one of his, his top guys, a uh, man by the name of Sifu Eric Winnick. And I liked Eric. We were, we were, we trained together for about eight years, seven, eight years. Uh, my, 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 my math may be a bit off, but the reason why I feel we connected well is we were the same age. Right. And I think we understood the same things and we had a lot of the same interests. So when Sifu Rick passed away, again, I started training with Sifu Eric. And unfortunately, he was about two hours, but now the other way in Connecticut. So he was southeast instead of being more just south, right? So I, I started training with him. And um, I would see him once. In the beginning, it was twice a week. I would drive down two hours one way. So we're talking four hours in a week now, if I see him twice, right? And we would train for a few hours. Very, very, very uh, um, gracious with his time and, 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 and knowledge. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I think, you know, um, I've gotten a lot from all my teachers. You know, I think, uh, I think we can all say that. You know, I think we get more, you know, um, than just physical techniques. You know, one of the things that I really enjoy, you know, about training with different peoples in the martial arts is just enjoying their personality and their stories, you know, really just vibing with people, you know, and just building that relationship, you know? Um, so I would see him about twice a week. Um, and then after a few years, he decided to open up a school in uh, Norwalk, Norwalk, Connecticut, right? About the same distance. And I would go down, I would continue to uh, do my private lessons with him, right? Um, every week I was very earnest about that was, um, you know, I was very good for it. And then he started to have me assist him at his group classes in Norwalk. Right. So this was the first time I was really getting an idea of how to teach, you know, looking at curriculums, um, and then really developing those soft skills, you know, how to interpret movements, how to teach, you know, principles and concepts and, and, and theories. And about a year later, he opened up a second school. I believe in Greenwich, Connecticut, I believe, if I remember right. So now at that time, I was assisting him at both schools, right? Then he ultimately closed down the Norwich School, which had me going to the Greenwich School. And uh, at that time, um, I actually left my job to teach full time. We had a sponsor uh, at the time to kind of help the school grow. And unfortunately, things kind of fell through a little bit later. Um, but I will say, um, it was really good experience for me because I would drive down to Greenwich. Oh, I don't know, three times a week. So I definitely logged in the miles on my car. That's uh, there's no question about that and stuff. Um, but it really gave me a sense of hands-on and teaching and, and, and understanding the martial arts and dealing with different people. So I was with Eric for about, I want to say a good seven years. Um, learned quite a bit about him. And, and, you know, what I will say about Eric is, uh, you know, he was very progressive in his thinking. You know, um, he spent a lot of time with Rick and then he started to spend a lot of time with uh, Paul Vunak, which then ultimately he started to spend a lot of time with Tim Tackett. Uh, he brought Tim Tackett out a few times for a seminar. Um, but Eric was always very progressive. and He would look at things and try to find ways to challenge us to, to um, improve our attributes, to improve our abilities. 
So then when we go back to doing things that, are, that were considered more simple, we would really excel at them, right? He always talked about keeping an open mind and, and, and not just keeping an open mind, but being the best that you can be. And that's something that really uh, stay with me, even to, even to, to, to now with, with training with different people, to always be your best, to never be satisfied with your current level and to always look at things with a discerning eye. So in about 2010, uh, we split up and uh, I decided to start training with other people, right? So a few years later, I found another JKD uh, Kali instructor. Because At the time I was doing JKD in Kali with Eric. Most times when you're a JKD guy, you kind of have that Kali uh, umbrella also that it, 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 it falls under. So then I started training with a man named uh, Sifu Dustin Santamena who was out of Boston. And Seafood Dust and Santa Mena was part of Cast Magda's association, right? So it was very different. If you, if you come from the JKD world or, or you at least dabble in it, you'll know that each lineage is a little bit different than the next. And they each kind of focus on something a little bit different. Each has something to offer for sure. So I left Eric in 2010 and started training with uh, Seafood Dust and Santa Mena. And I did that. I trained with them privately, uh, again, every week. And it was another case of me driving now an hour and a half, two hours, but now uh, uh, east. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I guess I feel fortunate in a sense where I've never lived close enough to one of my instructors. You know, I always tell people, if you live close to something, sometimes you take it, you know, for granted, you know, um, because you just feel like it's going to be there for, for, for the next day. And a lot of times, you know, if you take it for granted, then it's no longer special. So I guess I feel somewhat, uh, I don't want to say privilege or blessed, but fortunate that I was able to kind of adopt this mindset a long time ago with, you know, learning how to train on my own and, and, and um, be somewhat pragmatic and proactive in my approach. So I was with Seafood Dustin about two years. And basically after two years, he sent me to his instructor, a man named Sifu Greg Pichardo. And Sifu Greg Pichardo at that time was in Long Island, New York. So now we're really adding on the miles now. <laughs> so I think it's safe to say that I've gone through about seven different cars. <laughs> um, so now I started training with Sifu Greg, and he was about three hours from me. So, you know, with Sifu Dustin, you know, why don't you start seeing my instructor? Sifu Greg Pichardo was, um, he's, he's an instructor under Sifu Cast Magda. Really, he's Sifu Cast Magda's um, East Coast representative. Right, for, for his association, which is the Magnet Institute, right? So this is in 2014, right? So I started training with Sifu Greg, and I started to go up to see him. I want to see every other month. And uh, again, very gracious. Um, I would go up from the weekends, and I would stay over on the weekend, and we would train privately, and then I would hop in all the group classes, right? So really, from Sifu Dustin, I started to train in C-Lot. Now, up to this point, it was always Jeet Kune Do and Kali, whether it was uh, with, with uh, Dave Elwood, going back to my correspondence time in the late, uh, the late 90s. Then I met with Sifu Rick and Sifu Eric. It was really JKD and Kali. And then when I started with Sifu Dustin, uh, roughly in 2011, 2012, now it was JKD, Kali, and now it was Silat. Right? So I, I started to kind of try my hand at Silat. And I liked it. I liked a lot of the principles that were there. Right, and at this time, I was already an instructor under Sifu Eric. I, I was uh, he uh, he certified me uh, before I left, and so I started to train with Sifu Greg, and he really started to refine my knowledge and understanding of of what I thought JKD Kali and Silat was. Right? I really enjoyed that time with him too. So I, I would go up, like I said, on the weekends, and and I would train with him in New York. I would stay over on the weekend, and I would hop into any seminars that he was teaching, and hop into group classes, and then I would just do private lessons with him. So shortly after that, he uh, presented me in front of Cass Magda. We're talking, I want to say 2013, 2014, I believe still, 2015. And then I started to train a little bit with Sifu Cass. And that's where, then I, that really is who I'm currently certified under is under Sifu Cass. So I, I received my instructor uh, credentials in this art, uh, JKD Kali and Sila under Sifu Cass. In 2013, I actually have to look at my cert to be honest, <laughs> to remember. <laughs> um, and then what happened was Sifu Cast would actually come down to New York twice a year. So he would come down in May for three days, and then he would come 
uh, down roughly in November for three days. And he did that for, for quite a while. I believe we stopped hosting him in 2000, roughly 2016, 2017, uh, if, if, if my math is right. Um, which then following, I started to travel out to California, continue to train with Sifu Cass. And I, I continue to train with Sifu Cass and Sifu Greg uh, to this day. So around that time too, 2015, I met another man through a, a, a friend, mutual friend named uh, Guru George Chaber. And Guru George Chaber was another JKD Kali CLAT instructor, uh, but he was an instructor under Harley Elmore and Van Asanto. So I used to go to his, he used to have monthly workshops at his school and there'd be a different topic, you know, every month. One month could be Kali empty hands. The next month could be, you know, single stick or stick and knife. And then the next month could be Muffalindo Sula. So I started going to his um, monthly seminars and he was over in Bethel, Connecticut. So now we're going the other way in Connecticut. So he was about an hour and a half the other way now. Now he's more West. <laughs> so I, uh, I've, I've been all over Connecticut, lack of a better term or, or, or way of saying it. Um, so I started to train with him and he accepted me as a private student. So I would just like with Sifu Greg and, and, and Sifu Dustin and uh, Sifu Eric, I would go and see him as often as I could, right? So now I start running into the issue of juggling multiple instructors, right? So I'm training with Sifu Greg, I'm, I'm going after Sifu Cass and I'm still with Sifu Dustin a little bit. Now I add Sifu uh, George to the mix, right? So through Sifu George, and I, I started with him about 2016 or 2015. So again, it was another way for me to refine uh, my JKD, my Kali, my Sila, you know, and one of the things I, I really started to learn is that through these individuals, um, well, one is I don't know it all. And, and one teacher doesn't know it all, right? So they started can to we, give me- Can the, we hone in on that for a moment? Sure. Because that- I mean, everything you're talking about is good, but that's an important concept. And I want to stay mm. there for a minute. Sure. Because there are a lot of people listening who have probably not trained with multiple instructors, you know, outside of, of a single school anyway, sure. for, you know, any period of time. I, I would, in fact, I would say most people, you know, pick a school, they train at that school for a while, if not indefinitely, maybe they'll go to a seminar or a camp or something, you mm. know, they'll get a little bit of cross training, but. I have a similar, uh, I'm going to call it problem that you do in, in that I have trouble mm. saying no and someone that has knowledge yeah. I don't yeah. offers to share it with me. So I, I, I want to I wanna unpack that a little bit and then, and then I want you to go back to, to your train of thought there, if you don't sure. mind. No, sure. You know, the way you expressed it was no one person, I, I'm, I'm going to botch the words, but what I heard was no one person has all, of, all the knowledge, all the information. That, that's right. That's right. You know, I think, you know, just like you said, I think, uh, you know, a lot of us as martial artists, you know, we, we want to grow. And I think there's just, there's just so much out there. And I think people, a lot of times they look at curriculum and they look at this codified list of techniques, this, this physical sense of martial arts. And I think what they forget is that each person carrying that backpack, right. They have different experiences. They have different insights and, and backgrounds that lead you and that really help you to you know, quote unquote, cross the river, right? So although, you know, I was doing JK Dean Kali with multiple people, right? It was different in the sense where I was getting an expression and, and these different experiences handed down for me from each teacher. Hey, this is what works. This is what doesn't work. Oh, you know this? Well, this works for me and here's why it works for me. You know, so they would be putting their own little flavor and twist into things, right? So yeah, you know, you can always say a jab is a jab, right? But I think when you look at something, right, something means different to everybody. And I think based on people's experiences, right, they don't work the same way all the time, right? Um, and, and that's really, you know, that's one of the biggest uh, labels of advice I can give anybody is that, you know, you should train and you should train with as many people as you can, you know, because I think that, you know, one, everybody has something to offer, you know, whether it's, whether it's the black belt, whether it's the white belt, whether it's, you know, someone that just does it part-time versus someone that's, you know, teaches it professionally. I think you can get something from everybody. You know, I don't think one person has it all. And I don't think one person will ever have it all. You know what I mean? I think when you do martial arts for a long time, and I, I'm coming up on 30 years, 
it doesn't feel like 30 years to be honest. Um, but I think, uh, once you start getting past physical techniques, you know, you start looking into expressions and you start looking into flavors based upon the experiences of the people teaching it to you. And I think as a martial arts teacher, that's what you reflect on when you begin to teach other people. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, I, I really, I, I think that's what really helps you. I mean, what do you think, Jeremy? I do. I'm going to put it back on you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you use the example of a punch and, you know, we can talk about the basics of a punch, you know, you extend your hand and you hit with, you know, a certain spot and you're connecting to a certain spot. But as you get higher in rank, there's a lot of nuance there. You and I are roughly the same height and build. And, you know, so we're used to being smaller. You know, there's a good chance that if we're sparring with someone, they're taller than us. For everyone, regardless of, of height, there's a good chance that if you're in a self-defense situation, you're smaller than the person attacking you. It's just, just what tends to happen. So when you talk about the incredible nuance of height differential, weight differential, mm. and movement, and limb length, and all of that, there are situations where certain techniques work in certain situations for certain people. And to me, I could teach the same thing to 100 people, mm. and they're going to receive it slightly differently. And then if they That's teach true. it to somebody else, they're going to receive it slightly differently. So I look Absolutely. at it as... Instead of trying to stop that, which is the instinct of a lot of people, no, we have to keep it this or traditional. I say, lean into it. The problem can become the solution. The solution is, let's allow, not, not only allow, but encourage that individual flair in martial arts. I'm not, I, I, can, I can learn the same form. You know, let's, let's take a form that's um, pretty well known across martial arts disciplines. Empi, you know, it's a, it's a Japanese kata, but uh, it's a very popular form that shows up at darn near every tournament I've ever been to. And it, it can be different depending on the style. And that's what makes it great. Yeah, sure. And that's how there are notes to compare. If, if all of the Jeet Kune Do that was taught was the same and was just a copy. Sure. You wouldn't have the opportunity to learn it in different ways from different people because they would all be teaching the same thing. I think that's perfect. I think, yeah, I think that's perfect what you said there, Jeremy. I think, you know, you, you just, you know, just to kind of stay on the, on the whole topic of Jeet Kune Do, when you look at Bruce Lee, you know, what worked for him isn't necessarily going to work for you or me or for anybody else, depending on size, shape, background, or experience, right? So I think it's really understanding how to express yourself and knowing what works for you. You know, one of the things I do with people is um, I do what we call SWOT analysis, which is strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, Right. And I think a lot of people will apply that as a, as a tactic, right? Um, but I like to use that tool to look inward to see, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are, where are your opportunities for improvement? You know, what are the threats that, that go on you, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think a lot of times in martial arts, you know, and you, you'll certainly agree, martial arts is such an exterior vehicle, right? You're always being criticized. You're always being under the eye. Yeah. You know, you're always, someone's always watching you, especially if you, if you put something up on YouTube, right? And I think because of that, there's a lot of judging in the martial arts, right? And I think one of the things that we have to constantly do is, you know, just really, really what, what Bruce Lee would say is just looking into that mirror, right? And understanding, you know, who you are, what you can do versus what you can't do and identifying those weaknesses, right? And, I, you know, I, I used to always tell people, sometimes when you look into a mirror, right, sometimes you don't always like what you see, right? You can be overweight, you can be a little older than you want to be, you can be out of shape, you, hey, maybe you have a few injuries here and there, right? But if you don't ever look into that mirror, you'll never get that self-realization. You'll never begin to understand where you are and where you can grow from. And, you know, I get it. Sometimes look into that mirror and, you know, you're not seeing exactly what you, you know, you're not seeing Brad Pitt, right? <laughs> You're not seeing, you're, you're not seeing, you know, Donnie Yen on the other side, right? But I think if you can honestly accept who you are and, and, you know, pinpoint what you need to fix and, you know, just really just accept who you are, you're never really going to grow. You know, that's one of the things I always teach my students. You know what I mean? Don't be afraid to look foolish. Even now on this podcast, this is my first podcast. So, um, you're doing great. I wouldn't have guessed. You know what? I'm probably not going to look that. Um, yeah. 
I'm going to be like a typical actor. I'm not going to go back and watch it because I'm just going to cringe. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So, so this is my first podcast. And, you know, um, when you contacted me, I was a little hesitant about doing it, you know, because I'll be honest, I don't think much of myself. You know, I'm just a guy out there trying to learn and, and improve like any, anybody else. Right. But I wanted to do it because I wanted to see how I would handle the pressure of being questioned and having an audience. Mm. Right. So I, I wanted to challenge myself. So I guess there was a uh, uh, underlining uh, a thought process in, in, in me doing this. You know, you know what I mean? I wanted to see how I would react. Just like if I was not good with the English language, then I would start writing articles for, for different magazines. Let's just, you know, for example. Right. So I wanted to see how I would perform under some kind of pressure. Could I articulate what's in my mind? But I feel comfortable enough, you know. Or how would I flow from word to word, right? So um, even you know talking to you, I'm, 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 you know, there's these mini battles in my head. Oh, you know, you should say, no, don't say this, no, say this, right? So sometimes I think we have to put ourselves in positions where we're not comfortable, right? Because that's where we're going to grow. You know, it, Dan Asanto, he has this tremendous saying. You know, it's from the old that we gain comfort from, but it's from the new we grow, right? So I could continue to you know, teach privates and, and teach out of a garage, you know, uh, out of a gym or something, right? And, you know, I could be king of that castle, right? I don't ever have to worry about going on, you know, podcasts or being on, you know, late night talk show, right? So I become comfortable within that mold, right? But then what happens is I negate, I, I separate myself from growth, right? And I think a lot of times people only identify growth by ability. And I think there's just so much more than just physical ability. You know, it's, I think it's the ability to, to speak and, and articulate what you want to say, especially as a martial arts teacher, right? They always say, you know, you have the fighter, then you have the coach, right? You don't want to, you know, who would you want to learn from? Would you rather learn from Mike Tyson or would you rather learn from Customato, right? And I think most people who know would probably say Customato, right? Because if you're in a room with Mike Tyson, he probably wouldn't be able to teach you how to get where he's at. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot of different levels that we have to uh, really submit ourselves in the martial arts and, and be pragmatic in thinking and say, hey, you know, this is not all about punching and kicking. There's a lot more that we want to polish in ourselves, whether it's, you know, our ability to speak, think, problem solve, um, and, 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 and things of that nature. So, so I hope I didn't mean to take a little side road there and stuff. There, but, there... There are no bad tangents on this ah, show. I like it. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I have a, a, a teacher, a Guru George Chaver. He used to say there are no dumb answers, only dumb questions. You know, and, and I'll be honest, I don't even agree with that. <laughs> no. I, the, the, only, the only questions I hate answering are the ones when people ask them to hear themselves talk. They already yes. know the answer. Those are, I, I, and I wouldn't even call those dumb. Those are ego. Yes, 100%. 100%. So, um, okay, where was I? I got to thank you. Yes. So sp speaking of uh, Guru George, so I was with him. I'm still with him. Uh, I'm going to say about four years. And I, I, again, now I'm kind of running into that, that, that gamut of, you know, training with uh, multiple teachers um, in really the same arts, which at the time is, is JKD, Kali, and CLAT, right? So I'm trying to balance these, you know, two to three different curriculums and really try to dissect what each person is, is teaching. Because again, everyone comes from a different place and have a different thought process. So I'm really trying to pull in these, these ideas and concepts. And um, through Guru George, I met my Sarada teacher, uh, Guru Tony DeSaro, who was also in New York, but he was on the other side of New York. So with Sifu Greg, um, who's my primary instructor in the Magda Institute Association, he was in uh, Long Island. Guru Tony was in Albany, which is on the other side of New York. So I guess at, at this point, I just realized, like, you know, I just can't get lucky finding anybody close to me. So I might as well learn everything and then be that guy, I suppose, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, I started to learn from uh, Guru Tony about four years ago, and I started to train in Kabbalah's es uh, Eskrima Sarada, or Sarada Eskrima, right? Which was similar to Filipino Kali, um, but different in that is more of a middle to close quarter system, and a lot of times the stick is a little short, right? I don't want to don't want to get too much into the actual history of the art. Uh, so I started to train with him. I started to travel down on, I want to say, a uh, every other month, right? Just like with Sifu Greg, I would 
spend there for the weekend and, and, and really try to dissect as much as I can and come back and, and, and work it and teach it to my students and really use them as kind of a, a, a warm body, right, to really improve and stuff. Um, around the same time, I started training Wing Chun Kung Fu. So I guess I've, I've always had this, this uncontrollable hunger for just growth and learning and, and just, you know, continued knowledge. You know, and the more I started to train with more people, this is 2000, right now, where I think we're in 2016, um, I guess I, I began to realize, like, hey, you know, I don't know it all. And, you know, a lot of these guys just have these wonderful stories and just ideas of training. You know, I really begin to adopt, you know, that. And I think, you know, people always say, you know, martial arts, you know, it, it, it teaches you discipline and, and, and respect and it, and it kind of molds and shapes you. And, you know, what I'll say with that is that, you know, I don't think it's the martial arts. I think it really was my instructors. You know, I see them all as family. They've all been incredibly humble and, and gracious with their time and knowledge, you know, and I think they're the ones that really have helped me to understand and just really just be a better person. You know, you, you, you know what I mean? I think there was a time in my life and probably a time in a lot of people's lives where they think they know it all. So, you know, they tend to be a little arrogant, especially when, when I was in my 20s. You know, from from what I understand, I was a bit of a uh, um, terror. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have a good friend that always reminds me. Um, can can you be a little sure. little more uh, sure explicit with that? What do you mean by terror? I think sure. we, I think most of us who you know you're you're I, if I'm doing the math right, you've got a, a year or two on me. But you know, when we're in our forties, we look back and we're, you know, oh my god, twenties, right? And and you look back, and I think most of us would be critical of ourselves at that stage in life. But what do you mean? Sure. Well, so this was this was back um, when I was in my twenties, and I was training with uh, Siko Eric, um, again, wonderful, wonderful teacher. Um, and he really, really, after Rick, not including a uh, Siko Rick, not including my Taekwondo instructor, he was my first real JKD Kali guy. Uh, like I said, Sifu Rick died, and a lot of my early training came from Sifu Eric, and I think like most people who start training in something and they get good at it, they tend to get a bit of a big head. Um, and then I found myself getting better and better where then now I started to teach those classes over in Norwalk and, and, and Greenwich, Connecticut. And then now people started calling me Sifu. So I think uh, at that time, my head got a, a bit swell. Um, and what I really lacked was just experiences. You know what I mean? Lack of training with other people, lack of getting out and training other arts and seeing how other people do things, right? So I think really um, I didn't have that experience. But of course, at that time, the whole world revolves around you, right? And you think you can go out there and, 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 and break down trees with your, with, 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 the, with your kick and, right? and not be held against it and stuff. So um, during that time, I think I, I, I certainly have learned a lot about what to do and not what to do. For sure, you, you know what I mean. I think I, I, uh, I think I've I at that time I think I upset a lot of people within that that crew with uh, Sifu Eric and stuff. I think uh, my ego got the best of me in a lot of cases, um, which I guess looking back at it now, I can use that to kind of spot it early on with my students. You know what I mean? I think I, I think do. as martial art teachers, we have to be incredibly perceptive and aware. Of not just what's going on on in our own body, but you know, like uh, for example, like a week we we uh, talked about, you know, uh, prior to being you know live here, um, I, I work in aerospace. So within aerospace, you know, um, and and for those who don't know, aerospace is really you know airplanes or military uh, uh, weapons or even uh, aeronautics, which is more like a NASA. Um, I've had several mentors, and one of my mentors told me a long time ago. You know, there's always two conversations that are going on. And this is something that I carried over into my martial arts training. So he said, there's, two, there's always uh, two conversations going on in a room, right? There's the one under the table, which is what you don't see. And then there's one on top of the table. And so when he told me that, it really took me back. So what, what he meant by under the table, he meant people's attitudes, their opinions. You know, if they had a hard morning, you can just see it on them you know, where they're coming from. If somebody is overworked or underworked or underappreciated, you, that comes out when the meeting happens, right? That becomes on the table, right? 
So I think as martial arts teachers, we have to be super aware, uh, not only of ourselves, and, and, but also of our students. You know, how are they developing? How are they interacting with the other students, right? How are they interacting with the Sifu or Sensei, right? I think that all comes into play. And I think that that creates a healthy atmosphere if you understand how to see those things and block it. So I think, you know, during that time, I think I was a bit arrogant and, and I certainly had a large ego, um, but very much just not, you know, a world traveler yet, I guess, lack for a better way of saying it, right? So I wasn't seasoned, you know, um, as my Sifu cast Magda would say, I wasn't seasoned yet in, in seeing and understanding these things, right? Um, but because of it, I'm really able now to kind of get a, bite on on when somebody kind of walks down that road you know what i mean i am really able to kind of nip it in the bud and um right now currently you know i teach just privates right i actually just moved uh from massachusetts to connecticut so i don't teach anywhere openly as of as of right now so i can be somewhat selective of, of, of who i teach um but i think uh i think with that experience i think it, it's it's taught me a lot about the person i was versus the person i am now you know and i uh there's an old saying I I I really like. Uh, it the, the name escapes me who who uh, said it, but you know, uh, really, the phrase is you want to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you want to take advantage of other people's weaknesses, right, or or mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. But really, if you can take a step back, right, and you can kind of catch it ahead of time, right, before it even gets there, you're even better for it, right? So in Jeet Kune Do, we would call that attack off intention or attack off preparation, right? So I guess in a physical sense, it's you see the guy go to punch, right? You can physically see that movement, and then you would hit or intercept, which is what Jeet Kune Do means, right? We would intercept the fist, right? But if we take another step back and we have, feel the intention of the attack, right? It has not shaped, it has not, it has yet to put itself into a physical form, right? And if we can intercept it right then and there, right? It's a lot less abrasive. Does that make sense? Sure does. Yeah. So I think, you know, I, I think we can learn from other people's mistakes and stuff. But um, I, again, I think it really comes down to perception and awareness for sure. And I think that's something that I learned over the years from training with different people. And I think that was such a healthy thing for me, for me. And I, I you know, I, if someone wants to stay in, in the same school, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, um, as I get a little bit older, I'm turning 40 this year. Not too excited about that. <laughs> um, but as we get older, I think you begin to see, you know, when, when you begin to look at martial arts, you know, and I'll quote, you know, Guru George Chaber, you know, one of my, one of my current instructors, he, he always says, you know, martial arts are two things. You have martial and then you have arts, right? So martial is obviously what everyone knows, right? It's, it's the violence. It's the military. It's, it's you know, doing what needs to get done, right? It's, lack of a better word, it's violence, and it's training yourself in that violence, right? When you get to art, really it becomes the creativity, the expression, the, the problem solving, right? It becomes the functional versus the non-functional in a sense, right? And, you know, I think as you get a little bit older, you know, I think uh, once you get past your 20s and 30s, it becomes less martial in the sense where, you know, um, Hey, you know, you're doing this for fun. You know, you're, you, you, you enjoy what you do. You, you're enjoying the, the learning process, right? And you want to challenge yourself more, right? I, uh, I, I once heard a Chinese martial artist say, you know, martial arts should improve your quality of life, right? It, it shouldn't stress you out. It shouldn't put you in code orange, you know, like a lot of these guys who are into like this tactical stuff and, you know, they're always walking around like in the red, so to speak, right? It should improve your life. It should improve the quality of your life. If you're getting injured from doing martial arts, then, you know, you're not doing it right. You know, and I'm certainly not saying, you know, uh, train in something that's not going to help prepare you for a, a real fight. You know, all I'm saying is that once you have the ability and you know you can fight, right, and you have the ability really to protect yourself, right, there has to be something more than just, you know, hitting a guy in the mouth or putting a thumb in his eyes, right? There's a creative side to this. Right. And I think that's what needs to really get explored. And I think that's what's going to help you to, you know, train and train healthy as you get older in, in, in this in, in these arts for sure. Mm. You know, well said. so. But, uh, so, yeah. So apologies. So no apologies needed. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. You're making <laughs> okay. my job easy. I just I'm, I'm just hanging out. 
I'm working to... through this thing here. So you're doing so, great. So I sort of thank. I appreciate that. So, um, so uh, I, I forget what what, what you're in, um, but I started training uh, Kabbalah Sarada Scream with uh, Tony and stuff. And um, so once again, my my number of instructors have gone quite up. And then around that time, 2016, 17, I started training Wing Chun Kung Fu. Um, really enjoyed the Jeet Kune Do, but wanted to really dig into more what that style was all about, Wing Chun. You know, Wing Chun is one of Bruce's, you know, three arts, you know, that he used to kind of develop, you know, his method of, of fighting or develop his understanding, which was Jeet Kune Do. So I wanted to um, really dig into that. And fortunately, I found a guy um, only an hour from me. So I actually cut down some time, which was nice. <laughs> um, so uh, man named Sifu Ed Chow or Chow Chun Ying um, trained really uh, started back in the late sixties with the uh, teacher uh, for Professor Long Ting. Then years later, moves um, to a uh, Ip Chun student. Uh, but he's been in that art for about fifty four years. Uh, New England Wing Chun uh, over in Connecticut and stuff. So I started training with him every weekend. We could, would still continue to train with uh, my Serata teacher every other month. And then still see Sifu Cass, uh, try to get out there once a year to California. Usually we stay out there for a few weeks, really get my training in as far as the association goes. Uh, then I would continue to work with Sifu Greg every other month, drive down to uh, a, a Long Island. Um, and then as well as see Sifu um, George Tabor um, on, a, on a monthly basis as well for his workshops and, and, and do private lessons. And then Somehow, some way, I found time. I, I don't know. I just always, I always found time or found some way uh, to, to continue to train with other people. Um, in, in the mid-2000s, I was training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu over in Massachusetts. And lately, for the past few years, I've been doing catch wrestling under uh, Coach Mike Miggs. And I would go see him every few months, every three months of stuff. And really the same thing. I would go down for a few hours, drive over to Boston, really just spend the whole night with him training and stuff. Um, so that's pretty much current up to date. I think I, I, I think I named everybody that I can think of, <laughs> um, but you know, I, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I've been really fortunate, you know, to, to have so many wonderful teachers and, and, and train in the martial arts and, you know, really just, I always, you know, tell people to go out and train and experience something. You know, if, if you want to learn more about Aikido, then, you know, go out and learn Aikido. Um, if you want to learn more about, you know, Balintuak, you know, go out and do Balintuak, which I actually have a Balintuak teacher as well. Uh, which, yeah, I know, I know it's, it's terrible. I, I know everyone's listening like, you know, what, what's up with this guy? And I actually have a, a modern no, artist teacher too. So it's, no, it's what, terrible. What, what's funny about it is that, you know, there's, there's the, the joke, you know, whether it's the, you know, the, the sitcom, how I met your mother, Barney has a guy for everything, or, you know, most of us know somebody who, oh, I, I know who you could go see for that. You, you have a martial arts person for everything. Oh, you know, you, you want to learn this? I, I, I know somebody. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible. So I feel bad if, if, if I miss I don't anybody, think it's bad at all. I think it's great. You, you know, like I said, you know, um, it really, what it is to Jeremy is, you know, um, I don't have any kids. I've been really fortunate to have a pretty good job for shift. So really everything else besides work and spending time in my life, I've been traveling to do martial arts. You know, uh, like I said, I think early on, doing things in the nineties, you know, starting off with the correspondence tapes, I've always been self-sufficient. I've always wanted, I've always had this deep hunger for, for knowledge and for growth. I've always just wanted to get out there. And, you know, if, if something interested me, you know, nothing was going to hold me back. Like I, like I said, you know, started doing Balintuak last year, you know, and, it, and it's, and it's kind of interesting, right? So people always say, okay, you know, you train with this guy, you do this art, you do this art, you do this art, right? How do you remember them all? Right. That's, I've gotten that question quite a bit right and it's, it's a very good question you know what i mean and i think as you train on these things long enough well first is you begin to see patterns right you begin to recognize lines and patterns right um you know if you look at a punch right what changes from style to style of that punch is how somebody postures right so if somebody holds it by the chin versus in the center of their chest versus on their hip excuse me right? That's what denotes style, right? Like Bruce said, a punch is still a punch, right? It's just how somebody presents that punch and it's the posture in which they're in and how they deliver that punch, right? So you could look at things and you could say, okay, you know, 
each one of this person, each one of these, these individuals do one technique and they're all similar, right? But their presentation and how they deliver that technique is a little bit different, right? But ultimately it comes from the root source, right? It's still an extension. It's just the point of deployment and the point of recovery are now different, right? Mm -hmm. So I've always been really, I've always had a really easy time seeing those patterns and lines, right? Now, certainly there's things that I do that I'm a little bit more serious in. You know, I, I, right now I teach five different martial arts. I know that sounds a little crazy. Um, but then there's other ones that I train in that I just do because I enjoy it. You know, um, for example, you know, with, with like catch and, 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 and Berlin talk and modern armies, I have to just for all those. Right. Um, I don't do it to remember a curriculum or to try and attain rank in those, you know, I, I do it because one, I enjoy the process of learning. I enjoy that learning curve and I enjoy doing something that challenges me. And there's things that I see that can improve me as a martial artist. You know, so I'll go into those into certain systems trying to look for something to get out of it. I, I, I'm not necessarily going to adopt the whole curriculum, right? I think at this point, I think my mind is over, over, over flooded anyway. I don't think I have anything more to, to put in my head. <laughs> but, you know, I think what's more important to me at this stage in my life is the relationships of the people that I have in the martial arts more than so the techniques that I, I learned from them, you know? Mm. For sure. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, um, when, you, when I start pulling out all my curriculums, I think, uh, at least I do, I see more similarities than I do differences. You know, I, 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 I for certain, 100%. I, uh, it doesn't matter if it's different Filipino systems. You know, you can put this system against this system against this system against this system, right? And I guarantee you're going to see more similarities than you do differences. You know, one hundred ways we can move. That's right. That's right. And you know, I mean, you look at someone like you know Dana Asanto, or you know, a lot of his followers, or you know, anybody else really pragmatic in the martial arts. And these guys, they go out and they train different things. You know, and they train because they're exploring, they're learning. You know, and I think they fuel their curiosity, which I think is good. You know, what I mean, uh, you know, for myself, I'm not trying to know everything or train with everybody. I think I'm just fueling my curiosity. And I think I just really enjoy the process of learning and challenging myself for sure. You know? Yeah. yeah I, I think, uh, that's what I really enjoy. At least at, at this stage of my life, I, I, I really enjoy training and learning and, and studying with different people and understanding, you know, the things that I do wrong. If, if, um, I have, uh, one, one of my good friends, uh, uh seafood Dustin, uh, he's the one I, I started with before I went to seafood Greg. He used to always say, you know, if somebody can teach me something I already know, but put a different spin on it, you know, put, present it in a way that I may have not seen, that's valuable to me. You know, um, I think there's a lot of truth there. I think, um, especially if we start training in a lot of different things, I think a lot of times we start to collect, right? You start to collect more and more techniques, right? And I think that be that could become bad for, I mean, the obvious reasons, right? It's like, you know, what, uh, uh, Grandmaster Ed Parker used to say, I'd rather have 10 things that could fight me instead of 10,000, right? But really, you know, he was kind of getting at the idea of, you know, not overthinking the process, right? Guy grabs you, you hit, right? You have a few well-tuned responses to, to a majority of what can be attacked with, which really is kind of the, you know, antithesis of what, what, what Jeet Kune Do is and stuff, right? Um, but I believe you have to go through the process to learn different things, to, to really whittle down that, that statue of like, say, Michelangelo, right? You have to, you, you just can't end up in a, in a polished state. You have to go through that learning process, mm. you know? And I think, you know, each person that you work with, I think they give you something to that. They give you something to that, you know, for sure. You know, totally. mm. 100%. Let's flip, you it. know, we've, we've, sure. we've talked about the then and the now, and let's talk about the, the future. What's, sure. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to guess, you know, I don't usually do this, but sure. I'm, I'm going to guess, you know, okay. if we, if we look five, 10 years down the road, you still have what many people would say are too many instructors. Mm -hmm. You're still passionate about the martial arts. You're still traveling, training, trying to squeeze every little nugget of wisdom you can out of the people around you sure. and probably still loving it. Am I, am I yes. missing anything there? No, I think it's as long as I still have hair on my head too. <laughs> Careful. 
I'm beginning to get a little. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah, it's beginning to get a little. You know, it, it's not. It's not hard to see. You see yeah. any pictures of me? It's pretty. It's pretty darn clear. <laughs> you know what? I I think uh, I think as you do the martial arts for a long time, you develop a thick skin, right? And you know you're in this because you want to improve as a human being. And I think you know everybody gets something a little different from the martial arts. And you know I think you have to get a thick skin. I think no matter what you do, you're going to be criticized, right? You can pick. I mean, we can pick anybody out there from, you know, martial arts to an actor and actress to, you know, somebody, you know, iconic, like, let's just say, oh, I don't know, like Christ himself, right? You know, every, all these guys are, are, are criticized for something. Right? You're never going to get everybody on the Jeremy train or the Nate train or, you know, the Dan Asanto train, the Bruce Lee train, right? So I think you have to do what makes you happy. And I think if you can see the value in that, and it's making you better, a better martial artist, a better teacher better fighter then i think you know there's value added in that you know i think um when you really begin to understand things everything is just movement just you know, it's perfect what you just said it's just movement you know the the concept of physical techniques no longer really apply anymore right it's just now what you see is a is a stylistic view of delivery of something right you don't necessarily see you know a technique per se you know and i think you know, not speaking for myself, but I think that's how a lot of people can train in you know, multiple martial arts. You know, all the teachers that I trained with, excuse me, they all train in multiple martial arts. You know, whether it's just JKD Kali or you add in Sila or now you add in Wing Chun and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or maybe a little bit of Thai boxing, right? Um, I think everybody, I think they're all able to see those patterns and lines, you know, and they're able to draw the essence of those arts, you know? And, and then and just teach them outwardly for sure yeah. Yeah, for sure cool this has been great and you did yeah I've, I've enjoyed it. this has been interesting for me trying to figure out what i'm gonna say <laughs> well this is actually this has been really educational just just for myself as, as you know growing so. it's an interesting exercise to put yourself it out is. there to talk like this and you know if anyone wants the quick and dirty experience of of doing this Go back, especially to the earlier episodes where, you know, I, I very much followed a script in asking mm. the questions. And when the guest is talking, just turn the volume down and you answer it. That's not a bad way either. That's and very then good. when I start talking again, turn it back up and listen and, and then answer that question. Sure. And it's, it's really funny. You know, you listen to people come on and... and you know, I, I don't know how many people have listened to every episode other than me. Sure. Uh, I, was, <laughs> right. I was there for all of them. Um, but it seems like it should be easier than it is. And yes. what I've noticed is that the guests who just kind of go, they're just like, mm. I'm just going to talk, have the best time. And when I started the show, the one thing I was not concerned about was getting martial arts instructors or, or people in the industry to talk. Because I've been in enough classes with enough instructors for enough places to know martial arts instructors can talk. <laughs> of course. I, you know, you, you're spot on. And you know, I think one of the reasons, too, that led me to, to, to doing this is that, you know, I like to practice what I teach, preach. Excuse me. You know what I mean? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always telling my students to, you know, train outwardly. Train with this people. You know, look into the mirror. Identify what you're weak at. And you know, improve upon it. So I knew, you know, never doing this before, I was probably going to sound like a total dingling. But, you know, if I didn't subject myself to it, I would not be a good teacher, right? If I, if, if I wasn't out there training with multiple people and trying to understand, you know, different things, but I expected my students to do it, then I wouldn't be any better for it, right? So I've always told my students, you know what I mean? Anything I ever ask you guys to do or advise you things, to, you know, advise you to, to do, I'm doing myself. Right. And I think that's important as teachers. I think, you know, we, we, we tend to challenge our students, but I think do we really challenge ourselves. I think we really have to be the message. You know, if we want, you know, our students to compete, well, maybe we should compete and understand what that environment is like. Right. It's uh, so I, I it just, you know, I think perfect. You know, it's like, you know, I've never done a podcast. Right. So I'm going to subject myself to a podcast. So I'm going to put myself out there, whether I sound, you know, good or bad, you know, and get that experience and that understanding of it. You, you know what I mean? So I'm saying, okay, I've done it. 
this is what I have to learn from you, right? So I think, you know, you should never be afraid to look stupid, no matter if you're training, if you're speaking, because really it all comes down to growth and understanding, right? You don't, I always tell people, you don't want to be the big fish in, you know, the small lake, right? You always want to humble yourself and, and, and stay modest and try to improve, right? Don't be afraid to look dumb, you know? Because, I mean, ultimately, this is your story. This is your journey. You know, what you put in is what you're going to get out of it, you know, 100%. Now, if you know anything about me and my training, you know that I can certainly relate to training under a number of people and traveling for that training and doing all of that. So I certainly have found a kindred spirit in Sifu here. But what didn't come out in the episode was there are a lot of people who think very highly of this man. And when word got out that he was coming on the show, I got a number of messages. So not only was he a great guest, he's clearly made an impact on those around him. Thank you for coming on the show, sir. Hope we get to meet up and train together soon. You can visit whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to see the show notes. There you can find videos and links, social media, pictures, and more. And it's not just for this episode, but every one we've ever made. If you're willing to support us and the work that we do, you have lots of options. Make a purchase at whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Or leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help out with our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash whistlekick. Do you have guest suggestions? Let us know. Our social media, which we put a lot into, is at whistlekick everywhere you can imagine. And my personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Hey.